Hello everyone and welcome to the Speculative Wildlife Research Center, where we reimagine creatures and monsters from all realms of fiction through the lens of speculative biology. Today we will be looking at grey aliens. You know the ones. Grey, short, humanoid extraterrestrials that love abducting people and giving child me nightmares. Grey aliens are probably one of the most common depictions of aliens, and have been sighted and reported as having abducted people in real life, even if the origin of these sightings has been tied to popular culture, especially to a particular episode of TV series The Outer Limits. Still, grey aliens are such an iconic image that it should be really fun to reimagine them as real living beings, with a little dash of something else along the way. So here goes a thank you to everyone who wanted to see this episode and to our patrons and channel members for their support. If you too are enjoying these videos, please consider supporting the channel by liking and subscribing or joining our Patreon to get early looks at all our creatures. Now, without further ado, let's get started. While we have met extraterrestrial beings in our files before, the Ghidorah was, in the end, a being so far separated from us to allow a certain admiration born from the vast distances between us. That is not the case of the beings we will meet today. While it is hard and, some may argue, pointless to give a scientific name to creatures whose evolutionary history and phylogeny we can barely deduce, the discovery of more and more alien life forms has led to the tentative naming of a few of them, including today's research subject, Polycorpus senonus. The flying saucers, as we call them more commonly, seemingly evolved from similar but much smaller organisms the likes of which still orbit nebulae all around the observable part of the galaxy. These organisms, however, have adapted into much bigger forms capable of traveling much farther in search of resources. Also, unlike the smaller members of the proposed clade, flying saucers are composed of a main body and several accessory bodies. The main body is the saucer itself, which travels through space thanks to a rotary organ around it. Due to its particular physiology, completely free of liquid and fluids that would freeze in the cold of space, this rotary organ is formed around the body completely separate from its internal anatomy, allowing it to rotate freely. A special organ, called the electromagnetic or EM organ, containing metallic and magnetic components and located inside its body, keeps the ring rotating continuously and the centrifugal force produced is utilized by the saucer to move forwards, requiring a minimal use of energy to do so. The main way these organisms have of interacting with their environment is through their accessory bodies, which are usually unseen, stored within the inner compartment of the main body and sent out to sense and manipulate their surroundings. They are also much smaller than the main body which not only allows them to be stored easily inside the body, but also prevents their loss from having a meaningful impact on the organism. These accessory bodies evolved from simpler structures that were connected to the main body through long chain-like filaments, but became separated to allow them more freedom of mobility. In this modern species, the accessory bodies are connected to the main body through electromagnetic waves produced by the EM organ, which keep communication between the main and accessory bodies, as well as between the main bodies of different organisms. The outer surface of their bodies may seem unusually smooth compared to creatures from our world, but the reason is twofold. First, their skin is completely smooth to avoid interfering with their own electromagnetic signals. And second, these organisms lack all kinds of orifices, having small, discrete pores instead. The main function of these pores is receiving sensory information, including the electromagnetic signals that allow communication between them. 
despite being connected to the main body and being dependent on it for survival, the accessory bodies are capable of acting autonomously in order to better explore their surroundings, and so present many characteristics proper of living organisms rather than sensory or manipulating organs. For instance, these bodies have a notable degree of cephalization, reuniting their sensory centers and nervous system in order to process all information about their environment. This has caused their head-like structure to be very big in comparison to their bodies, unimpeded by the lack of gravity in their environment. Their so-called eyes are huge and composed of specialized cells that detect not light but the ambient electromagnetism present in their environment, as opposed to the very specifically tuned orifices used for communication. These cells, however, are quite sensitive to damage, and are covered in a hard black screen that protects them from debris and the UV light present in their natural environment. These eyes are also present on the main bodies, although much less noticeable spread around their top and underside. Their bodies are packed with elastic polymers that act in a manner similar to muscle in our bodies, but this tissue is quite soft due to its low gravity habitat. While it helps move the appendages of the accessory body, it is also used to keep its internal anatomy stable, adjusting for changes in local gravity. This compact body allows them to move and function both in space and in planets with low to medium gravity, adapting to it as needed, but may be crushed by the gravity of planets over a certain threshold. They will use their lower extremities to hold onto substrate with soft suckers while looking for sustenance, while its upper extremities are used to manipulate its environment. The hard and sharp protrusions present in their upper extremities allow it to cut and break matter in order to extract edible particles. The main bodies, for their part, are completely covered in hard and rigid tissue, which helps them resist changes in pressure or gravity from damaging them, something seen when they enter the atmosphere of a planet. The flying saucers sustain themselves by passively feeding on hydrogen and other elements found in gas clouds, while the accessory bodies obtain solid matter from their environment, such as carbon and different mineral components. The accessory bodies will process this solid matter and introduce it to the main body through special pores lining their inner compartment, and the main body, in turn, will provide the accessory bodies with gaseous fuel which is absorbed through specialized pores. The gaseous and solid nutrients obtained by the saucers have different functions, with the first acting as the fuel that keeps them functioning, and the second being transformed into the matter that constitutes their bodies, helping them grow, regenerate, produce new accessory bodies, or even reproduce. This reproduction is achieved through the accessory bodies, which will exchange genetic material between two saucers once they have successfully performed a mating dance together. Each saucer will depart and form a new organism within a special compartment, to be released only once its rotating ring has been developed enough for it to move on its own, as well as form its own accessory bodies through the nutrients provided by its parent. However, it will remain at its parent side until it is old enough to defend itself through specialized use of their EM organ. In the meantime, the new saucer will learn travel routes and other important information from its parent. While these organisms inhabit a wide range across the observable part of our galaxy, our planet has become quite a hot spot for them in later times due to the huge amount of electromagnetic waves being constantly produced by our technology. However, despite the flying saucers being attracted to our planet, it is not particularly interesting to them once they arrive, especially given how noisy and busy it seems due to the presence of airplanes and other aerial vehicles, causing these beings to leave quickly. Occasionally, they will use their accessory bodies to obtain local lifeforms, 
but this seems to be a matter of curiosity, and the kidnapped lifeform will usually be set back without any harm done to it. Aside from the trauma, that is. While the electromagnetic waves produced by our tech are usually harmless to the saucers, they can on occasion be quite overwhelming. In 1947, one visiting flying saucer came too close to a small town in New Mexico, became disoriented and crashed into a water balloon. While the balloon fell to the ground below, the saucer was luckily unharmed and flew away, back to the safety of space. Originally, their behavior, migratory nature and lack of any and all forms of body language, rendered useless by the huge amounts of information conveyed through their electromagnetic waves alone, caused scientists to think of them as non-sapient beings. However, this is quite far from the truth. Studies show that these beings have incredibly high levels of intelligence, likely as a result of the need to navigate their vast habitat, remember their feeding routes, and process the information obtained from their environment as well as from their very complex communication. They have been observed methodically exploring their habitat, and their aforementioned curiosity betrays a noticeable value in learning from their environment, all things that point towards this intelligence. In fact, it is likely the only reason no true civilization has evolved from these beings is the lack of interaction between individuals due to their solitary lifestyle and the vastness of their habitat. So far, communication with them has been impossible due to the complexity of their language, which we have barely begun to detect using specialized equipment, but it is likely this could be achieved in the future. It is, however, debated among the scientific community whether contact between the two species could actually prove beneficial to either or if it could have any unexpected ill effects on any of the two. And that's it for Speculative Biology Look into Grey Aliens. And it was about time, since it has been too long since our last extraterrestrial life form on the channel. Now, I took a less literal approach to this reimagining for the sake of making it more interesting. See, the thing is, there is little to no information on what these alien beings are actually like, aside from their very brief incursions on Earth. And with so little to pull from, taking them at face value would have meant making them too close to regular people, but in space. Instead, I chose to take what little we know about them and take that as the biological basis for our version. And what is one of the most important things about grey aliens? Of course, them flying around space on flying saucers. So I decided to use that and consider both aliens and their spaceships as part of the same organism. This also helped solve the issue of their overly humanoid appearance. These aliens are usually depicted as having a very human-like anatomy, including the very same body and facial structure, which would be almost impossible given both would have extremely different evolutionary histories. In real life, only the animals genetically closest to us have an even passing resemblance to our anatomy. And, of course, we wanted to ignore the whole ancient astronauts thing. Instead, I decided to make this similarity much more superficial and rather coincidental, being the result of different environmental pressures leading to a humanoid but not really that much appearance. I really enjoyed working on this episode, and it was really fun to take a dive into creatures so far removed from everything we know, and I really hope you guys enjoyed the end result. And remember, if there's any type of creature you'd like me to give the speculative biology treatment in the show, please sound off in the comments below. Thank you all for watching, and see you next time on the Speculative Wildlife Research Center.